Now, what a game last night. It finished Bohemians. No, because Shamrock Rovers are at home. Now, what a game last night. It finished Shamrock Rovers. Neil Bohemians won at Tallis Stadium. The most incredible League of Ireland game that I've ever seen. Over 6,400 fans at the match. We spoke about that with James Talbot, the Bohemians keeper, and playing in front of that atmosphere as well. But two red cards in the first half for Shamrock Rovers. And... Just really an unbelievable game, and a man who was watching it for Air Sport is the former UCD Shamrock Rovers and Sheffield Wednesday midfielder Paul Curry, who you can also see on RT and here on Off the Ball. Paul, how are you? Yeah, very good, Jamie. Yourself? Good, thanks, Paul. Now, that was your first live game for Air Sport. You probably couldn't have handpicked a more dramatic one to start off on. Yeah, it was an excellent game. Um, you know, had the feel of a real proper football match. Even the build up to the game, people were talking about it. Two teams, massive rivalry, and two teams in form. So um, it was a good one to be a part of. It was a good one to actually be there and witness. Um, and it was just a really, really enjoyable game. Yeah, I suppose we really couldn't, when you're trying to watch the game, really believe what you were seeing with two red cards for Rovers in the open, kind of 38 minutes, Trevor Clark on 27, and then Lee Grace was sent off for a second yellow. We're just having a look on screen here at. At the first one, and there's been a little bit of debate last night on whether it should have been a red card, whether it should have been a yellow card, if Roberto Lopez might have caught Danny Grant when he was dragged down by Trevor Clark. What was your own view of it? Yeah, I, I know you probably don't think it was a red card. I thought it was. Um, and the reason being is that I think if Trevor Clark doesn't pull Danny Grant back, I think he's getting shot off and goal and a clear run through and goal and a goal scoring opportunity. and. If the rules are the rules, if, if Trevor denies them that goal scoring opportunity, then it's a straight red. Um, and I guess the irony of the situation, had it been anybody but Danny Grant, Trevor Clark probably would have caught him. Um, because Trevor's so quick and he makes up that ground so quickly. But on this occasion, I think Danny Grant was through in goal. I think he would have got a shot off and I think Trevor denied him that opportunity. Yeah, again, having watched it back on video, I thought watching it live that Lopez was a bit nearer to the ball than he actually was and you can see we've just shown two screen grabs there on, on screen and it, it does look like Grant is through on goal in terms of the second one Paul it goes to a second yellow card for Lee Grace and you guys really had to slow this down in the TV truck and confirm that it didn't hit Lee Grace's hand that it actually hit his head yeah we were sitting in the studio behind that goal and we would have had an ideal view of it as it happened live and Listen, I think everybody in the ground thought it was a handball. It was just the, the way that Lee went down and the direction that the ball went, the fact that his arms were extended out, it just looked as if it had come off one of his arms. Um, now, I guess when a ball typically hits you in the face, <laughs> you, you tend to see somebody go down clutching their face, but this has literally come flush off his forehead. Um, and it was very, very unfortunate. I, I, I don't think you can criticise the referee. Um you could maybe look at the linesman, but even at that, it happens so quickly. It's only when you slow it down that you really get to, to own in on the fact that it came off his forehead. So, listen, people call out for VAR in the Champions League and the Premier League, and it's only when you slow these situations down that you're able to, to see it very clearly. So I actually wouldn't be too harsh on the, on the officials last night. Yeah, and I suppose, you know, you guys being on TV, you have the luxury of seeing replays and slowing things down and there's no chance that in the League of Ireland in the next you know, number of years that the referees are going to have that opportunity so they have to see it as they see it and give the decisions they give and Paul McLaughlin gave the two red cards in the end and then it becomes 9-11 Dinny Corcoran takes the penalty, Alamana saves it he manages to score the rebound and it's 9 players versus 11 players for the next 60 minutes but the game ends 1-0 and towards the end Rovers did have chances to actually you know maybe get a point Yeah the, the point that I was making last night is that you know, whether you're training to defend or attack with only 10, that's maybe something you might practice. You very rarely do that, a 9 v 11. And it's almost as if Bohemians got, um, not carried away, but they probably got a bit confused as how to play against the 9. It looks as if they were trying to force things at times when they probably should have just been keeping the ball moving. Um, and it's just a very false situation. It's, it's not something that you plan for. It's not something that you ever really practice to play against. And probably people like Keith Buckley, I, I, I just thought he was trying to do things that he doesn't normally do. Um, you know, Keith's game is very, very much about keeping things simple and winning the ball back. And at that moment in time in the second half, I just thought they should have worked Shamrock Rovers a bit more and not conceded possession or, or try to force as many... Um, to create as many clear-cut opportunities when they should have just kept the ball moving. That said, Rovers didn't have too many opportunities. There was that one, obviously, for Dan Carr over the top. 
and maybe once or twice they look threatening from a set piece. But I thought for the majority of the second half, albeit they didn't move the ball too well, Bowes still looked very much in control. Yeah, Paul, and over 6,400 fans at the match. It was the biggest ever League of Ireland crowd at Tallah Stadium. Tallah Stadium opened all the way back in 2009 with the, the stand behind the goal full and, and the far side half bows and half rovers as well. Uh, and again, lots of commentary overnight on Twitter about just how positive that is that we can get that many people to a game on a Tuesday night. Yeah, it's a proper stadium. I think that's what we have to look at first and foremost. It has the feel, it has the look, it has the facilities of a proper, proper ground. And I'm not sure you can say that about too many within the league. Um, and that should be um, the given. I know it's it's unrealistic to expect that in six months, 12 months, even 24 months. But going forward, that has to be the foundation that we're laying here in, in the League of Ireland because that's not replicated a- across the board. And the difference that it makes, um, the atmosphere, the environment, the pitch... Everything was just set up. It's a high-performance environment, and that was then replicated by the atmosphere that the fans brought in the day. And I just thought it was an excellent occasion for everybody involved. I, I just, like I said earlier, I thought it had the feel of a proper football match, and that's probably not something that we say enough when it comes to the League of Ireland because sometimes, whether it be, you know, Belfield Bowl that probably lacks atmosphere, Richmond Park that I don't feel is up to scratch. There are stands and stadiums around the, around the league that aren't replicated and aren't meeting the standards that the likes of the Shamrock Rovers are setting. Yeah, and I just want to show you a front page of one of the newspapers today in the Irish Daily Star, a photo of Dara Leahy here and basically telling the Shamrock Rovers fans to shush and that just shows the emotion of the game and the players of the game as well and you could see at the end of the match Paul you know how much it meant to Bowes to win that match and you know the, the run goes on against Shamrock Rovers and for Rovers they're disappointed they were that they couldn't get something given they'd won eight matches in a row but Rovers are still five points clear at the top of the table of Bowes Bowes have a game in hand Dundalk a couple of points further back Dundalk host Shamrock Rovers now on Friday Rovers will be missing Lee Grace and Trevor Clark the other eight outfield players had to play 60 minutes with nine men as well. What impact will the match last night have on Friday against Dundalk and on the rest of the league moving forward? Because, you know, from the point of view of Dundalk, I know Vinnie Perth and John Gilbert both there last night. They'll have been really, really happy that Rovers lost that match. Yeah, I think if you're Stephen Bradley and Sean McRovers, you're probably wishing you didn't have Dundalk on Friday evening. But that's the way it's just, it's fallen for them. Um Probably the manner, the performance will, will please Stephen Bradley. I thought they were excellent. I thought the commitment, I thought the passion, the resilience, the togetherness that they showed in that second half in particular was exceptional. And that's not something that we've necessarily associated with Shamrock Rovers over the past two seasons. So, yes, they'll have tired bodies, but they still would have taken a number of positives from that game. Um, what he does and how he reshuffles the pack or how he rejigs things without Trevor and without Lee Grace will be interesting because... Trevor's probably another one who's gone under the radar has been extremely, extremely positive with regards to his comeback and the manner of his performances this season. So that would be a huge loss. Lee Grace is is their ball-playing centre-half, so it'd be interesting to see what he does. I imagine Joey O'Brien will go play centre-half, but the likes of a Joey O'Brien, the likes of a Ronan Finn, what are their bodies like? They don't seem to play too many um, two games in one week anymore, so it'll be interesting to see what happens there, but it's going to be a difficult game. Dundalk and Rovers, there's always a bit of needle. I even remember when I was there, particularly between the likes of Vinnie Perth and Glenn Cronin, there was always a bit of a needle between the two of them and there's a bit of bite and that has been evident in games gone by. So, listen, it'll be an interesting game. Um, Dundalk have managed to come into a bit of form. I still don't feel as if they're quite at the levels that they were last year and I, I think Shamrock Rovers have probably exceeded them in regards to the performances that they've put in this this season. But, It'll be interesting. They're very hard games to call, Jamie, and that's evident with Bows and Rovers. You don't it's a flip of a coin, you don't really know how it's gonna go, but you imagine that Shamrock Rovers and, and the form they're in, you'd be hoping that they'd be able to bounce back similarly like they did last time they were beaten by Bows. Yeah, that game kicks off in Oriel Park this Friday. 8 o'clock, Paul will be there again live for Air Sport and should be a packed Oriel Park as well. And uh, They've installed some new toilets in the away end and the home end as well and in what the new chief executive has said are going to be small uh, but gradual improvements in Oriel Park. 
Paul, I want to touch on two other things briefly. Firstly, we're talking on Wednesday afternoon. It's just 20 past one. We haven't heard from the FAI yet about the awarding of the European licences, but we expect that St. Pat's will be awarded a licence to be in the Europa League qualifiers and Waterford won't be given the news this week. And Lee Power, the Waterford owner, has said that he is going to appeal that decision. But as far as we're aware, Pat's will be awarded the last licence for the Europa League and Waterford won't. We're kind of a week on now from, from when that news broke. What's your overall thoughts on, on that news and that Pat's will be playing in the Europa League and not Waterford because Waterford, of course, haven't been called Waterford Football Club for three full years which means that they can't be awarded a licence Pat's finished fifth which means that they'll jump up and, and play in those qualifiers in the summertime Yeah well I got a sniff of that last year and I think there was people around the league talking about the fact that if Waterford got European football that there was a chance that they might not be able to play I feel for the players I feel for the staff I feel for the owner and I feel for the fans um, you know they worked really hard last year they put in a number of good performances and they earned their position in Europe through their good league position <laughs> that said it goes back to the Trevor Clark incident like the rules are the rules we can't be bending rules in order to let teams in or make exceptions and I guess UEFA can't be making exceptions um, at certain times for certain clubs so it's it's very difficult um, for Waterford I know financially what that would have done to the club would have been huge and it would have been great European nights back down in Waterford not too long ago they were playing in the first division. On the flip side, it's brilliant for Pats. It's an opportunity that the players probably weren't expecting to have. Uh, financially, listen, the owner and the CEO and the manager would be delighted that it brings extra money into the into the club. Um, listen, I, I think a lot has been made of us. Why? I don't really know. It doesn't really involve too many of us, whether that be fans or whether that be players it's it's very much with the relevant parties at the moment and it's just a matter of time to see how it plays out i understand that uh power down in waterford will do everything he can to to fight his corner but it, it's literally just a matter of time at, at this stage and it'll be interesting to see how it pans out i do feel sorry for the people of waterford though yeah and lastly paul one man i feel sorry for at the moment is the cork boss john caulfield looking at their league position so far like 12 points from 12 games, three wins, three draws, and they've actually lost six matches. I was down in Turner's Cross on Bank Holiday Monday for a scoreless draw against Sligo, and listen, it wasn't a great game. Both teams were quite direct, played a lot of long balls, and I think the crowd was just over 2,300, which again, for me, on a Bank Holiday Monday, isn't a bad crowd, but John Caulfield has been getting stick from some of the Cork City fans, and you know some people saying that his time at the club should come to an end. I just look at what he's done over the last number of years and, and you know brought the club from... from nothing to league champions cup champions doing well in Europe and massive crowds at Turners Cross so I think they need to give him some time but it's not clear if, if that time will be given to him Yeah I don't think anybody can, can really take a pop off John Caulfield and what he's done for that football club down there and the success he's brought and the players that he's brought into the club has been absolutely brilliant what you would say is that a shake up was needed um, it was a bit of an ageing squad and he'd obviously lost key players the likes of a Sean Maguire to the UK which was very difficult for him to replace um, and they, with Graham Cummins coming back he hasn't really picked off where Sean Maguire um, had been so successful so <laughs> it's very easy to, to take a pop of the manager and say that it, it's because of John that things aren't working he's brought in a number of young players and um, the likes of a Darrow O'Connor that are going to need time to bed in and, and get used to playing under the pressure of such a big club at Cork but you know how long does he get um, interesting to see I, I'm sure he'll get to the break and then maybe after the break if things don't turn or if things don't change well then maybe we might see a change in management or he might be given the season you, you just don't know it's a transition period it's probably one that's not gone so successful at the moment Um but what he's done for that football club in the last couple of years should not be forgotten. Um, but maybe further down the line, maybe it does need a, a new manager with fresh ideas. And you find that with football clubs that it just comes to a natural end and eventually somebody else needs to come in and present their own ideas and give the players something new to think about and a different style of play and a different shape. To say that now would be unfair because John Caulfield has done so much for that football club. Yeah, I think the one thing that maybe, you know, works against him in this scenario is the style of play. And the style of play is not good and it hasn't been good really since he's been the manager. And yes, it did really well with, you know, the pace of Sean Maguire getting in behind and, you know, that season when they did so well to, to start the season so well and, you know, win the league, win the cup and so on. 
and that's something that works against them. If you're not winning and you're playing bad football, fans have a moan. If you're winning and playing bad football, at least you can say, well, you're winning. But you can see, watching him on the sideline, his heart is on his sleeve. And I'm sure he's trying to do his best to, to improve results. And you've got to look, Shamrock Rowers are stronger, Pats are stronger. Waterford in the last couple of seasons have come up. You've got Dundalk as well. So just because they've done well in the previous couple of seasons doesn't necessarily mean that that will continue if their playing staff is not maybe at the level it was. But the style of play is something that probably they need to look at. And I don't know if John will change how he plays. So maybe the point you're making about you know, like a Neil Fenn or someone like that who can come in and, and play maybe a, you know, a more passing brand might improve the mood of the fans. Yeah, listen, I think if it's John Caulfield, if it's Stephen Bradley, if it's Vinny Perth, it doesn't matter who the manager is. A manager has to pick his team and he has to set up his team based on the players he has and in a style of play that he feels is going to be most effective. There's no point in UCD going out and sending the ball long when they haven't got the players to play that way. So if John feels that they need to be a bit more direct or their game is purely based around intensity and closing the ball down, well, then that's John's decision. John doesn't have to go out there and he doesn't have to start playing out from the back when they haven't previously done that or if he feels he hasn't got the players, it would be foolish to do that. So... <laughs> Listen, people might take a pop and maybe it's a double blow when you're not winning games and you're not playing out from the back. But fans have to be patient at the same time. They have to trust and put their belief in the manager that the manager is looking at this squad of players and saying, this is the way we're going to play. And um, often it's very easy to take a pop and say, oh, we're not playing football or we're not playing out from the back. If you haven't got the players to play that way, there's no point in doing it. There's more than one way to play this game. It doesn't always have to be out from the back. You can play into a front man and play for second balls and, and then try to pass the ball as you play and get into the opposition's final third. Like you said, though, when you're not winning games and you're playing that way, well, then fans' frustrations grow. Um, but I would just wonder, has he got the personnel to play the way Sean McGrowers are at the moment or the way Dundalk do? Great stuff as always. That's the voice of former UCD Shamrock Rovers and Sheffield Wednesday midfielder Paul Curry now on Air Sport or T and off the ball and he'll be in Oriel Park on Friday watching Dundalk against Rovers on the telly. Paul, thanks a million. Enjoy the game. Speak to you soon. Thank you, Jamie.